It's good to see you guys this morning. If you are watching online, we are glad you're virtually with us. We would love to see you in person, but we know some people can't. We've got a few folks having chemotherapy and a few other things. Um, But if you're just staying home because you like pajamas, I want to encourage you, we all like pajamas, to come and connect with people. There's something about giving somebody a high five and not doing it just in the mirror. That's a big deal. So anyway, I want to encourage you to do that. So Um, You know, I was thinking about Emily, one of our young people being up here. Emily, how old are you? How old are you, Emily? 15. What were you doing at 15? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So here's what's wild for those of us who are starting to count years backwards. Um, That's what uh, I I have an author who actually has a countdown clock. There's an author that I like, uh, uh, Bob Goff, who, uh, who... has a countdown clock. He found out the average age of men in America, and he created a clock that counts down. Is that not the most morbid thing you've heard? But here's, here's what's cool. As I listened to Emily sing and, and help lead us in worship this morning, I thought, you know, 40 years from now, I'll be 94. Yeah. Or more likely, you'll be visiting me virtually, <laughs> right? But she'll still be going. And so we've got to recognize that part of what we do as a church is called discipleship. And discipleship is what Jesus did. We call them disciples. What it means is you show somebody how to do what you know how to do. Why? So they can do it. And ready? Probably do it better. Probably do it better than you. But but that's the goal. And so as we see young people uh, coming up, and I remember when I was young thinking, young people, but now, yeah, young people, I don't know what else to say. And, uh, but it's neat to me, and it's neat to have our kids in here. I love, Randy and I were just talking about, you know, the fact that we love to get them to be a part of the service and then go over and not have to listen to the boring pastor. And then, you know, I mean, I had yawning in my 12 seconds while I was, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I, get, I sometimes bore myself, so it's all good. Now, how many of you know that I used to surf in college? Oh, good, oh, good. You come to church too often. So, <laughs> so, so when I was a surfer dude, hey, man, how's it going? Here we are. And by the way, one of my good friends who's been a missionary for many, many years in Papua New Guinea actually moved back to Sanford. So we're going to go to breakfast soon. We used to surf together. I never hit him with my board, but I hit all of our friends with my board, but that's not the reason I stopped surfing years ago. What's funny is when we used to surf, <clears throat> we would always see some dude on the shore. No matter how good the surf was, there was always some dude on the shore with his surfboard just sitting there. And the reason that the guys did that was, can you guess? Because the girls would gather around. And so we had a very special name for them. And you may or may not know this name. We would call them... Posers. And so we'd say, look at that poser. You know, he's posing. He's pretending he's something he's not. Why? Because he didn't surf. Now, the last time I surfed, you ready for this, was almost 20 years ago. And so I no longer call myself a surfer. I haven't called myself a surfer in a long time. If I did, I would be a poser. And here's why I quit surfing is because the last time I was surfing, the last few times I was surfing, I remember there was a lot of white water and there were nice breaks on the outside, but you had to paddle through the white water. And I remember paddling and paddling and paddling, maybe paddling some more and then catching a wave for like three seconds and then paddling and then, pa- and I went, this is just not worth it. So I graduated to a boogie board, and you can tell I've used this a lot. By the way, if you get a boogie board, get one with the plastic on the bottom. It's a little better. I love the boogie board. Let me tell you why. I don't have to swim. I can carry the boogie board. I can throw it over my head. I can dunk under waves and just go out, and then when I'm ready, I just jump on it and ride it in. Plus, for some weird reason, I think a shark won't bite me with this thing. It's the dumbest, really. I don't look like a seal. More like a manatee, right? But I could no longer call myself a surfer. Why? You ready? Because I don't surf. As Christians, we call ourselves followers of Christ. 
which means that we look at what Jesus did and we do what Jesus did or we do now what Jesus is calling us to do. But the truth for many of us is, if we're honest about it, our Christianity looks like me doing what I want to do and just calling it Christianity. We're sitting on the shore and calling ourselves surfers, and the truth is, we're just posers. And so many people call themselves Christians that aren't really followers of Christ. So that's the big picture question today, because the truth is, listen, we all become selfish and self-centered. But if you're calling yourself a follower of Jesus, it means that you're going to sacrifice your personal preferences. You're going to sacrifice your desires, your wants for what he wants. But the truth is, some of us don't even know what he wants because we haven't spent enough time in his word. So today we're going to look at this passage and we're going to look at three things that this is another way you could say it is three things that Jesus wants, but three things that matter, three choices that matter to God is what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about um, the cross. We're going to talk about a hospital, not a country club. And we're going to talk about the lost, not the found. So number one, the cross, not the crowd. The cross, not the crowd. Now, the Bible uses some words I don't like. For example, it talks about refiner's fire. And we've sang that, we've sang that song before. Refiner's fire is an old song. It's been around forever. Refiner's fire. And we sing it like it's such a wonderful thing. Refiner's fire is awful. I want refiner's jacuzzi. I mean, if we're honest about it, God, I want you to work in my life, but only really a a little uncomfortable. I don't want to be super, I don't want to really sacrifice. I want your life just to make me better, to give me what I want. By the way, a lot of TV preachers, if you listen to them, they're just giving you a psychology message and not a Bible message. Pay attention to that and be careful of anybody who's teaching you that the gospel is not about sacrifice. It's about getting, not giving. Be careful of those sermons because here's what Jesus says. So now let me set the stage for you. We talked about this last week. Jesus is sitting at dinner with religious leaders, okay? He's sitting at dinner with religious leaders, and what's he doing? They're all sitting from richest and most popular, the government officials, down to the peasants. So if, if you were the head of the table, you're the owner of the house, and then like the cool kids got to sit up there. You remember cool kids when you were in high school? I'm not going to ask which of you are the cool kids. We know. We can tell. All right? And, and, and how many of you were in band? Okay, I know where you sat. All right, so, um, did I just say that out loud? Sorry, Dave. Dave, were you in band? But you should have been in band. You were friends with all the kids in band, weren't you? Okay. I was just making sure. I thought we related on that level. I was in band and choir. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, just, yeah, nerds for life. All right, so... So Jesus is sitting with all these people and he starts teaching because he's looking around and he realizes there's a problem. Why? Because the religious leaders have now made what God wants into what they want. And he's now tweaking them just a little. So here's what it says. Large crowds, and we're talking about the cross, not the crowd. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate Father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person can't be my disciple. So he's got this dinner going on, he sees them doing wrong, and then he tells the crowd, hey, you got to hate everybody. And we read that and we go, that's easy. I don't like my family that much anyway. But that's not what he means. You have to understand, and let me finish this thought, and then I'm going to explain some Hebrew thinking to you. All right. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Do you hear that? Basically, if you just do whatever you want and call yourself a Christian, you're just a poser. That's what Jesus is saying. All right. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? Otherwise, you'll have the eyesore on I-4. Which is always amazing to me that it's a Christian organization that built that building. It's like they're still trying to finish it like they never read this verse. Like make sure you have the money first instead of how many years? Is it 30 years now? That, how many of you know what I'm talking about? If not, Google it. 
eyesore on I-4. It's a Christian organization that started building a building. It is still not done, but they're walking in faith. Faith and foolishness, by the way, are really close sometimes with some people. All right, here we go. For if you lay a foundation and aren't able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and was not able to finish I saw on I-4. I added that, if you didn't know that. Or, suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other's still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. I don't think we can beat them. Hey, we need peace in our time, right? In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. And then he says this, salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's neither fit for the soil, and I love this, or the manure pile. It's thrown out. And then he says, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear, which means it's like the kid sitting on the front row this morning that was yawning while I was talking, which some of you are doing, but you're very good as adults at holding it in. Jesus is saying, I hope you can hear what I just said. So Jesus talks about hating your family in order to love him. That seems really weird to us. So let me give you an illustration that might help. How many of you know I love my wife? You do. How many of you know that I love my little puppy Buster? Right? Some of you think I love the dog. Let me tell you something. I love my wife so much, it's like I hate Buster. Whoa. Really? Yeah. Yeah. If it's between Buster or Kristen, can I tell you who wins? That's what Jesus is saying here about family. He's saying, I want you to love your family. He's not saying hate your, he's not saying hate your family like literally hate your family. He's saying love God so much that you would so choose what God wants you to do that it almost seems like you hate your family. Now, you still know I love Buster, right? But if I was going to do this verse, I would say, love Kristen, hate Buster. And it was like, what? But, and that's even in the Old Testament about Abraham. You know, he loved one and hated the other, it says. What does that mean? He loved the one so much that even the love for the other one seemed like hate in comparison. I want you to love God so much. This is what Jesus is saying. I want you to love God so much that the love for anything else is like hate. Is like hate. So e even though you love your family, you care about your family, and obviously to be a Christian, you have to love others. There's forgiveness, all those things. But the truth is that you should love God so much that it's way above how much you love your family. So here's the big question. Who are you trying to please? Yesterday, um, uh, a friend of mine was talking to me, and he was talking about how he volunteers for this organization, and he's organizing an event, and he said, Eric, you know what surprises me? And as a pastor, I'm always like, yes, what surprises you? He said, the fact that I'm volunteering, and yet people complain. I said two things to him. Welcome to ministry. But I also said to him, you know I fire volunteers all the time. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, you have to. If people aren't doing what they're supposed to do, you have to say, I'm sorry, we got to get somebody else to do it. What do you mean I'm volunteering? I said, the other thing I know is, even if you do something for somebody for free, go out of your way to help them, people will still complain about it. I have a friend who's here today. I helped him move, and one of his friends cussed at me. I deserved it, didn't I, Brian? He was trying to, you were trying to be incognito for that one, weren't you? It wasn't Brian. Brian didn't cuss at me. You ever help somebody and you suffered for it? Ready for this? Welcome to the cross. Jesus was ridiculed. He was mocked. Everybody left except for one and a couple ladies hanging in there, right? His mom. <laughs> Mom's with you no matter what. She's not going anywhere, right? And yet we're surprised when we have to suffer for Christ. Is there anything that you love? Do you love approval more than Jesus? 
Do you love pleasure? Comfort. I love comfort. I don't know about you. I don't like discomfort. I don't like when somebody takes my chair, my chair, right? I don't like when somebody takes my remote. I don't like some, when someone takes my lane when they're merging. I don't like when somebody won't let me merge, right? Is there any relationship in your life above Christ? Let me read this little thought here. Focus on the purpose of the church. When church members become focused on their own comfort, entertainment, friendships, and programs, they can lose sight of the actual purpose of the church, and the church will decline. Surfside Community Church exists to help people find their way home to Christ so they can grow in Him and help others find their way home to Christ. Number two, so not only the cross, not the crowd. Number two, a hospital, not a country club. Speaking of little dogs, I, I like Twitter because you can interact with people that are famous. So I've had uh, some neat interactions where, where uh, a celebrity or somebody who I've looked up to has responded to something I say um, uh, a comedian that I really like responded to one of my tweets one time and said, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard, which I thought it was awesome. Do you want me to tell you what it was? I said, talking about politics on Twitter is like checking a diaper with your finger with the same results. <laughs> Brilliant. So the other day, Brian Duncan, who was a... a, a really great Christian musician in the 80s. He's still a great Christian musician. I shouldn't say it that way. I, suddenly we're all old. Uh, uh, but uh, great Christian musician, very kind of famous in the 80s and uh, uh, still famous, I guess. And uh, uh, he said, oh boy, I just have filled that whole thing up. Anyway, I really like Brian Duncan. He's a lot of fun. Anyway, so he said he got a new little dog and he took it out in the yard. And as he's watching the dog in the yard, you can fill the blank in on that one. As he's watching the dog in the yard, coyotes, two coyotes run at his fence and he had to run out, yell at the coyotes and throw stuff to get them to go away. And he barely got them to go away. And so I said to him, I've got lights that come on automatically and that's supposed to scare off coyotes. To which he responded, my backyard looks like a jail yard and it doesn't scare them. And I'm like, oh, no. But here's what I realize. He cares so much for his dogs. What does he do? He's willing to run out and risk coyote attack. Did you see the video of the mom with the raccoon? If you haven't, Google that one. I'm not going to play it. It's too long. But it's awesome. If you watch the video, there's a rabid raccoon latches on to a little girl. She runs to her front door, bangs on the front door. The mom comes out grabs the raccoon. The raccoon's trying to bite her. So she's holding a raccoon. While she's holding a raccoon, she opens the door and lets her daughter in. Then she, the daughter gets inside. She takes the raccoon and chunks it into the yard. Only a mom would do that. A dad would have found a bat and probably beat the raccoon and the kid at the same time and felt good about it. A couple bruises, you'll be fine. I wasn't going to grab that raccoon. What do you think? I'm crazy, right? But that's Jesus for us. Listen to this next verse. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Time out. So the reason they separate tax collectors and sinners is because that's what the religious leaders did. Tax collectors, they considered so bad that they would not put them in the same category as sinners. You know, like murderers, prostitutes, worse tax collectors. By the way, we have a tax collector who goes to our church who loves when I point that out. All right. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, I love that, and goes home. He doesn't even make it walk home. He puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friend, you heard me talk about this, and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven 
over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And here's what I'll tell you. We love that story when we're the lost sheep. But when we're the found sheep, we think, you know, the pastor used to say hi to me every week. And now that I've been coming here for five years, he seems to always just find the people that are new and talk to them. When's the last time you went out of your way for somebody who is away from church? Even bigger, when's the last time you broke away from your friends before church or after church to talk to somebody who you didn't know yet? Was that too close to home? You guys got super quiet. If you're watching online, it just got really still in here like, oh no. Jesus said, the shepherd, the good shepherd, what does he do? He leaves the 99 and he goes out of his way. Why? To find somebody who needs extra help. When's the last time you went out of your way? If we're not careful, what do we do? We only include people in our lives that we're used to including in our lives and we don't go out of our way for anyone. When's the last time you prayed for somebody who's away from God? When's the last time you went out of your way? Because the truth is, if we're not careful, we become a country club. We want church to look like we want, want things to be certain comfort. Oh, new chairs, I don't like the new chairs. I want more comfortable chairs. I want the temperature to be just like this. I want the music to be exactly what I want, what I like. By the way, you know what we call that? Television. We're so used to getting what we want all the time, we become more and more selfish, and we think everybody else ought to do the same thing. And the truth is, church is not called to be a country club. We're called to be a hospital to help people. And yet too many of us are decorating our rooms and adding new televisions to the hospital room. If I was, in the, I was in the hospital three times this year. If while I was in the hospital, I said, I'm bringing in a painter, an interior designer, and a technician from Best Buy to put up a new TV, they would say, we're putting you in the loony bin. And yet it happens at churches all the time. We focus so much on what we want instead of what God's looking to. Can I tell you a huge secret? It's a huge secret you haven't noticed yet. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people are going to move within walking distance of our church in the next year. Have you driven down the street yet? There are over a thousand, over a thousand apartments going in. And can I tell you something that happens? God only sends new people to churches where he knows they'll be taken care of. And so the question for us is, are we willing to sacrifice our comfort, our convenience, in order to welcome new people? Or are we happy just coming and sitting and soaking? Or are we willing to go out of our way? If I was a shepherd of sheep, can I tell you something that I know? I'd rather not leave for that one. I mean, I just got the fire going. There's dangerous stuff out there. There's lions and tigers and bears. I know, it's sad. It's really scary. Did sound like a cult, didn't it? <laughs> if that's the most cultish thing we do, I think we're doing pretty good. This week, um, I had a non-church-related thing to go to. And can I tell you, that I didn't want to go because I was like, I just don't want one more thing to do. And it was like the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart. How are you going to connect with people if you don't go where they are? Uh. <laughs> Last week, I told the church in the sermon, I said, the word for this year is connection. My kids have already used this against me. See, you think that pastors only use their kids as illustrations. No, no, no. They're listening to the pastor and they're like, oh, I can use that against him. So they said to me, I said, you guys want to go on vacation? That's expensive. But dad, this year's word is connection. <laughs> Hypocrites. Are you sacrificing to bring others home? 
Listen, if we're going to reach these apartments, can I tell you that this summer we're going to take a van down there during VBS. We're going to pick kids up. We're going to have to spend some money to do that. We're going to have to make room for them. We're going to have to have people serve. We're going to have to have people go out of the way. And can I tell you, some of those kids will be hyper. You know how I know that? Because I'm the pastor. And most kids are hyper. And they've run out of ADD medicine. I don't know if you've heard about that on the radio. The only stuff I got left is caffeine, so it's good. Number three, the loss, not the found. The loss, not the found. You ever lost something? I got some new earbuds a few years ago for Christmas. Kristen got me the nicest earbuds I've ever had. I had them in. I was working out in the garage. My nephews came over. I took my earbuds out, put them in my pocket. My nephew said we want to go fishing, so we drove over to go fishing. I, I went into the shed and got out paddles and kayaks and got everything ready. We went over there, and then I went to put my earbuds back in, and I found one. Oh, no. So what did I do? I retraced all my steps everywhere I had been, and guess what? Never found them. So I called the company that I bought the, registered the headphones with, and I said, I just bought these. Do you have a discount or something? They said, if you send us one back, we will send you a new pair. I was like, hallelujah. Ah. It was awesome. I'm like, and I got, in the mail came a whole new set. I was like, oh. By the way, I've been more careful since then. You ever lost something and then found it? That's what the next story is about. Suppose a woman has 10 silver coins, Luke 15, 8, and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? Time out. Let me help some of you out because you're like a coin. What's the big deal? Remote. Football game's coming on. Can't find the remote. And if you don't have the Dish Network, push the button and find your remote from a beep. By the way, even if you have that, you push the button and it starts beeping and it sounds like it's coming from the whole house. And what are you doing? You're lifting up couches. You're finding stuff in the cushions you've never found. You're like, oh, I had popcorn, right? Oh, there's that sock, right? You start digging stuff out. You're flipping couches over till you find that remote. That's what this is, okay? So exchange coins for a remote, guys, and you'll probably understand this better. When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I found my remote. You get the idea. My lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So here's the next question. Who are you praying for? Who are you reaching out to who's lost? Last week, I had the Bills game on while I was cleaning up the kitchen. Kristen was still at work. So I tend to kind of clean the kitchen, have the TV on in the background, and I'm I put on the song Final Countdown. Well, let me tell you what Final Countdown's about. <clears throat> I say, Alexa, turn on Final Countdown. By the way, if anybody at home has Alexa, they just put on Final Countdown at their house. <laughs> that happened a few weeks ago. <clears throat> so I got the dishwasher and I tell her that. As soon as that song starts, I open the dishwasher. Before the song finishes, I have to put all the dishes away and get all the dishes out of the sink and put into the dishwasher. If I don't, then I have to listen to Time After Time by Cindy Lauper. <laughs> Which Kristen says, I like that song. And I'm like, well, I'm not playing that for you. That's for me. It's like a punishment. Right? So final countdown. And I'm putting dishes away. I look up. And on the TV, it looks like they went back to the host and they didn't know they were on TV. I'm like, what is going on? These guys are sitting at the desk. I'm like, somebody has pushed the wrong button. This is great. And then I realize somebody's been hurt. And come to find out, they're given CPR for nine minutes on the field. For DeMar Hamlin, you guys have all heard that story by this time this week, right? In the meantime, as we don't know how he's doing, social media finds out that he's got like a $2,000 raised fund to help underprivileged kids. As of right now, that fund, you ready? Has over $6 million in it. Why? Why? Because people saw what happened on the field, realized, whoa, he may have just sacrificed his life. What in the world for a dumb game? 
we want to give to do something. Because this guy is suffering, we want to at least show him some support. You ready? When you and I recognize the sacrifice that Christ has gave, given for us, we should have even more commitment to say, God, what do you want me to do? God, who can I help? Who can I encourage? Who can I help to find their way home? When we really recognize, when, when we're not just posers, when we really say, God, I want to do what you've called me to do, when we really recognize what Jesus has done, you know what we say? God, how can I help other people find their way home to you? When I recognize what you've done for me, I want to see other people respond to that. My hope for you this week is that you would understand the sacrifice that Christ gave. And when he's talking to this crowd, and in the chapter before, when he's talking to the religious leaders, they have all forgotten why they're even religious. The crowd has forgotten what really is important. We all do that. So my encouragement to you today is begin praying for somebody who you know hasn't found their way home. And if it's you, today you can find your way home. In John 3.16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes, that means whoever puts their faith in him will not perish but have eternal life. If you're ready to surrender your life to him today, you can do that. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to become a Christian. Maybe you're here today and the truth is you have been a Christian, but it's become a country club for you. You haven't had any discomfort. You haven't had any sacrifice. Just ask God, God, what do you want me to do? And my prayer is in the next few weeks as we talk about what that means, that you would see people, maybe even a friend this year, that you begin to pray for. Maybe you put their name on your dash and you'd see them come to Christ and you'd recognize how great that rejoicing is when you see somebody that you know come home to him. We're going to close in prayer. Um, we're not going to pass the offering plate today, but you can give on your way out or you can give online. Thanks for being here this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word, your strength, your power, your love for us. Father, I pray that we would not just do what we're comfortable with, but Lord, we would do what you've called us to do. Father, I pray that you would help us not to just be a church that's a country club, but Father, really be a hospital for those who are hurting. Lord, I pray as individuals that we would have folks that we're praying for, that we're encouraging. Lord, help us to go out of our way to connect with others, not just in the church, but people who need you. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.